Hey everyone, welcome back to Robin, my tile-based vegetable puzzler I'm designing in the Godot game engine. It's been a good four months since I last uploaded, so it's time to take you through what I've accomplished in that time, including a massive milestone for the project that I'll save till the end. Let's jump right into it. Starting with the most important new feature, let's talk seasons. Why do I want to have them in the first place? Well, the main reason is for level variety. Each of the seasons will represent a new difficulty as you progress further into Robin. Starting with summer and ending things in spring, each season will introduce unique mechanics and a new vegetable to play with. The obstacles will include things like the sun cooking the vegetables, leaf piles on the ground, icy patches, wind that blasts them around, and more that are still cooking in the back of my brain. It also gives me an opportunity to set those levels apart from one another with features such as weather, falling leaves, or even changes to the sky color, and of course, cute, unique seasonal outfits for the player. Now, with that said, what do I have so far? Up to this point, in terms of art, fall has been my main focus, as you can see. Since most of the assets I designed in the first episode were for the summer levels, I've now designed several smaller props that can be scattered about the fall ones, such as the aforementioned leaf pile or this goofy little scarecrow. The ground and tree colors change too, and when you get deeper into the winter, the leaves will fall off, leaving the branches bare. In terms of in-engine additions, it mainly comes down to particle systems, which is the next thing I want to showcase. Let's begin with the leaves, which use a CPU particles 2D. This allows me to select each particle randomly from a sprite sheet, giving the appearance of different leaves falling from a tree or blowing across the screen. Both have a slight random spin to the particles, and the tree has a deceleration at the end of the particle's lifetime, so the leaves come to a rest at the base of the tree. This is definitely the more simple of the two particles I designed, though. The rain is a GPU particles 2D node, mainly because I want to have access to sub-emitters. The particle itself has a quantity of 50 and a velocity of 175, but of course, these can both be adjusted to make the storm more fierce. If I want to give the illusion of a heavy wind, I can simply adjust the X value within the direction set. The higher it is, the further to the right the rain will fall. The way I achieved the long shape of the droplets was by enabling a trail of size 4 for each particle, letting them stretch out. Last but certainly most difficult, let's talk about the rain splashing on the ground. I accomplished this effect by having each particle contain, as I said before, a sub-emitter that occurs on particle end. This sub-emitter is appropriately named Rain Splash and contains a material with a particle's animation. This animation only plays when the particle appears, and the particle only appears once, again, at the end of the raindrop's life cycle. At first I was having an issue where these sub-emitters weren't spawning on every raindrop, but I eventually found the fix for this by just making sure the number of sub-emitters matched the number of raindrops. Now I've also been putting a little work into the snow particles lately, and they're almost complete. It's really quite simple, I just have it emit with a set gravity and I tweak the turbulence setting to make sure that the particles kind of swing back and forth as they fall, giving a snowfall effect. Similar to the rain, I can ramp up the density just by increasing the amount of particles present. Now, during this particle demonstration, you might have noticed the clouds moving. This is accomplished in the level script using something all of us college students have learned to hate very well, a trig function. The code pulls the time in milliseconds, using this to get a changing variable that can be plugged in. I then set offset as a vector 2 that in its y variable has two parameters, speed and frequency, both based off the system time. I then add this offset to the position of the cloud sprite, and since a sine function swings back and forth from positive to negative, the cloud itself does the same. Let's talk about some accessibility features for the camera. The most important one that I've added is solely there to let you peek around at the decorations that I'll add to the levels, camera panning. By accessing the mouse velocity when the scroll wheel is held down, I'm able to subtract it from the camera's position, and when multiplied by a delta-related variable, I'm able to have a smooth scrolling camera. I don't even have to set outer limits for how far I can scroll, since that's essentially clamped by how far the mouse can move. I of course have a line of code right here, where when the scroll wheel is let up, the camera moves straight back to a centered perspective. This is great already, but I also have a zoom function implemented so the player can take a closer peek at the level, or zoom out to see it in its entirety. It zooms by increments of 0.05, and when the maximum or minimum zoom is reached, it performs this little function I created named Zoom Bounce. Now, the function itself is very convoluted, and probably has a much better way of doing it, but the final product is pretty simple. 
a little bounce to let you know that you've reached the zoom limits. After I posted the first devlog, I received a suggestion for the rolling vegetable from I Am Sushi, who rightfully pointed out that onions are toxic to bunnies. I decided on a pumpkin instead and went to work. The animation uses a very similar process to the tomato when it comes to functionality. Basically, the only difference is that instead of being pushed by the character, it gets quote unquote pushed every time it reaches an empty tile and can continue rolling. Not too bad to implement, all things considered, and completing all the sprites wasn't too time consuming, since I had the tomato to loosely base it off of. So in the last devlog, I mentioned that to collect a vegetable, it needs to be put into a basket. However, the functionality for this wasn't quite complete. This time around though, we've got a fully working product. When a vegetable is rolled into a space containing a basket, the normal sprite disappears and it flips up into the air, plopping into the basket. This may seem simple, but it requires quite a bit of additional logic. For one, both the vegetable and the basket have to switch which sprite is visible when the vegetable targets the space. Luckily, I'm already using a target position for other logic in my code, so that slots right in and I can access it fairly easily. This chunk of code is what manages the whole process for the tomato and it looks identical to the pumpkin with a small location change. I slow down the move speed to make the animation look better, set orientation, and initialize the frames of each animation before swapping which ones are visible. Then I play the tomatoes half, yield for it to complete, and play the baskets half. When it comes to the pumpkin, as I said, this function itself looks the same. The only difference is the fact that the pumpkin has to run this from process instead of a push function, since we need to be able to collect the pumpkin by shoving it from a long distance away. So how do I run a function only once if it's trying to call every frame? Simple. I do it the same way as my level script. I've got two variables, one named basketable and the other named into basket. Basketable becomes true if the pumpkin's target position is equal to a basket's position and it isn't currently entering a basket. If the pumpkin is already going into the basket, basketable is set to false. After all of that, if it's still true, then basket check is run, and crucially, into basket is set to true. This ensures that the function will only run a single time in any given level. But I hear you ask, what about undoing the move? I've got that covered too. Up here at the top of process, if input enabled is equal to false, which only happens when the player uses undo, then the two variables will reset. Finally, let's talk about some art and characters to liven this world up. The raccoon made his first appearance in the last devlog, and this time he's joined by a crow, and possibly a pig, but we'll see about that. Now, these little characters are fun and all, but wait until you see the next part. I've drawn a variety of character portraits for each of them, and for the bunny too. If you'll follow me over here, we see where these will be used, the game's dialogue system. The interactions between all the characters are going to be what makes this world pop, so I've taken the time to make sure that each of them can be represented in the form of these portraits. The raccoon might have a devious plan that he needs you to execute, and the crow will swoop down from the sky to laugh at your failed attempts. That's about all that's new for now though. Time to talk about what the future holds. First of all, I'm about at the point where I can start designing levels. Since I've got all the movement, the collection system, and everything involving it animated, it shouldn't be too bad to just crank out the summer levels since they only involve the tomato and a new secret mechanic that I'm still actively developing. I'll make sure to get some of my friends on playtesting duty to help me rank the levels in difficulty order as well. Second, I've got some very important news. I've commissioned an artist, V, who reached out to me at the tail end of last month. I'm very impressed by their work and we're already getting a final design nailed down. In fact, you can see right here some of the concept art that he's already sent me. Robit will have professional cover art for its Steam page. Now, as you can see, I truly have no excuse not to finish this game. Make sure to subscribe, join my Discord, and I will see you all in the next one where I'll be introducing the unique gimmicks that each season is going to have.